the morning, so you don't want to miss that. And uh, I think that's all I need to announce to you. There is this little event on Saturday, but most of you aren't invited to it, so I won't mention that. It's a youth event. And uh, since most of you aren't youth, um, you don't get to go. So it's just kind of how it goes. See, Susie, I'm kind of a rude pastor. Have you picked that up? I just don't, I don't follow all the rules. Yeah, but but I don't remember you having any kids. No, non-grown kids. I, everybody, everybody's a lawyer, too. Brother Keith, there is no way I'm letting you pick up a bowling ball. You got an LVAD, dude. <laughs> I don't know if I should be picking up a bowling ball, but I know for definite you shouldn't. And Brother Owen, oh, you're the one going to, I better go teach. These guys are full of it tonight. Let me turn your attention to the book of James, chapter number four. And uh, I will warn you that I am going to be reading out the New English translation. So all of you that have um, it is bad enough with all of you finally got broke loose that I'm going to use something other than the KJV, and then I go and switch on you again, right? All right. Well, I apologize a little bit, but uh, tonight I want to I, I want to use the NET uh, for a couple of reasons. I need something to come through a little more clearly. This translation does a better job with that. So uh, if it bothers you to be looking at something that doesn't match what is being read, then just don't look at it. Close your Bible and listen. Um, but if, if you don't mind and it doesn't distract you too bad to, to look at both, I actually think it's good for you because it allows you to think and engage the Scriptures as well. So whichever works for you. James is writing and he says in verse 1 of chapter 4, he says, where do the conflicts and where do the quarrels among you come from? Now, most of you um, have been around here enough to hear me make the joke that pastoring this church is a bit like um, riding a tiger. You got a hold of it by its two ears, but you better not lose hold of one of those ears or the whole thing's over. And um, the reality is, is that you and I need to understand and recognize that if not by the grace of God, we're not very good people. And we won't act very good either. And uh, I know that if we compare among ourselves, some of us act better than others. But the scriptures also say that those who compare among themselves are foolish. And so, um, because the only real comparison point is when we compare to God, to the standard of righteousness, and to what God demands of us. And so, when we compare to that standard, none of us are really, we're a bit obnoxious at times. We all think we're right. Does anybody here think you're wrong? When you think you're wrong, you don't say anything. So every time you open your mouth, you think you're right. I, I've never met a person who really just said, you know what, I think I'm wrong, but I'm going to say it anyway. Um, we usually open our mouths about things we think we're right on. Um, second thing is, is that I have found that human beings, we want our own way. Anybody here want their own way? And even if we understand that it is one of those things that might not be, there's only one way to do it, our way is the best way, or the right way, or the, 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 the most effective way. And so... We want our own way um, because we think it's right. Every man, every woman thinks they are right in their own eyes. And then the final thing is, is not only do we want our own way because we think we're right, we usually want our own way because we want something out of it. Can anybody be honest with me tonight about that? That's, that's where we live. That's who we are. And so it, it's, this church should be able to very quickly answer James's question, where do the conflicts and where do the quarrels come from? Okay? But he goes on, he says, is it not from this, from your passions that battle inside of you? And here, passions, I, I need you to enlarge that a little bit. You need to not simply think of that in the sense of love 
or lust, but think of it more of in the sense of desire. Things we want, whether it is material things or whether it's us wanting our way or whether it's any of these kinds of things. And so James really kind of puts his finger on it. He says, is, the, is it not? Do not these conflicts, do not these quarrels among you come from your desires, your passions that battle inside of you, that are in conflict with one another? You desire and you do not have. You murder and envy and you cannot obtain. You quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly. So you can spend it on your passions, on your desires. And so it's a circle. You know, you have wrong desires, therefore you ask wrongly, therefore you do not receive, because if God were to fulfill it, you would just spend it on these wrong desires, these wrong passions. Now, James speaks in a way that I uh, won't generally speak, as ornery as I am. Adulterers! Wow, that's quite a strong statement, but notice how he talks about it. It's not so much a sexual adultery. He says, adulterers, do you not know that friendship with the world means hostility toward God. So whoever decides to be the world's friend makes himself God's enemy. And please understand, by world's friend, that does not mean uh, the earth we're living on or the humans that are here, but rather it is those ways, those thoughts, those passions, those desires that are ungodly. It's a spirit of the world. Not a demonic spirit, even though the devil's involved in the process of that. But no, it's a spirit. It's an attitude. How many of you can remember back to when you first came to God and as you served Him, as you read His Word, as you heard preaching, as you, as you came to church, as you engaged Him, you began to have these things that God would put His finger on and you'd suddenly go, my goodness, why am I doing this? Or why am I not doing this? Something you needed to add. And, and it's hard to believe looking back that you didn't see it. That you didn't realize it was missing or it shouldn't have been present there. And it has to do with, that, with the world. The world, in fact, the scripture tells us that the, that the prince and power of the air of this world blinds our eyes. So we don't see what is right. Where we don't see what is wrong. Uh, I don't want to get real political here because this isn't political, even though it has political ramifications. But I've never had to tell a Christian, once they were filled with the Spirit, not to kill their babies. I've never... You listening to me? I'm being very transparent with you tonight. I've never had that conversation. It's not because I'm not willing to have it. I've never needed to. There's a spirit of the world that blinds the eyes of those who do not know God, that would think to take the life of their own child. And by the way, church, when you were dealing with folks who are walking towards God, but have not yet really, they don't have that relationship with God, you don't have to hit them upside the head. Chill out. Let them get to know God. God will fix the wrong way of looking at things. He'll fix it. You need to have confidence that He'll fix it. But when we find ourselves acting in a way that's not consistent with what God has revealed of Himself and of the way that He wants His church to operate according to the Scriptures, then we need to understand that we are, in fact, allowing ourselves to be friends with the world. Not the world in the sense of people, but the world as in that that wrong attitude, that wrong way. Then he goes on, he says, or do you think the scriptures mean the scripture means nothing when it says the spirit that God caused to live within us has an envious yearning? And then verse 6, but he gives greater grace. Grace is, I just had the lesson with our uh, New Life class last night on grace. And here we're told. Greater grace. Grace was pretty cool to start with. 
I mean, when I've taught that lesson, that's an amazing thing. The unmerited favor, kindness, mercy, and love of God extended towards us undeservedly. And yet in this scenario, James reminds them, even as he is accosting them, even as he is correcting them, even as he is <laughs> indicting them of being adulterers, of having a, a relationship with the world when they should be devoted to God, even then he says, but he gives greater grace. Therefore, it says, and here he quotes from the Old Testament, um, specifically Proverbs chapter 3, verse 34, God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Now on the basis of that statement from Proverbs chapter 3, James then says, so submit to God, and I like this translation, this is one of the reasons I used it, so submit to God, but resist the devil. In other words, these two actions, the way it's presented in this translation, are hinged. When I submit to God, by definition, the only way I really am in submission to God is if I'm resisting the devil. Put conversely, the only way that I am resisting the devil is if I am submitting to God. And then he goes on and says, and the devil, he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and He will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and make your hearts pure, you double-minded. There he's alluding back to that adulterous relationship, trying to decide. God's way, the world's way. God's way, the world's way. My way, God's way. This double-mindedness. Grieve, mourn, and weep. Turn your laughter into mourning and your joy into despair. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will exalt you. Now here's the reality. I haven't even told you what I want to talk to you about tonight. And I really haven't laid it out yet. So we're still in background or context. Here's the reality. You and I want our own way. And we may dress it up in a certain way. Because none of us, or very few of us, have the wherewithal to kind of look at God and say, You know what? You're wrong. I'm right. And we're going to do it my way. I've not met a lot of human beings who do that. Most of them gussy it up some other way. They, they dress it up so that it hides and looks different than that. But when you strip it down, you really get down to the bottom line is I want my way, and if God doesn't agree with me, I still want my way. Anybody know what I'm talking about? I won't make you admit that you get it. But anybody know what I'm talking about? Kind of recognize the contours of what I'm talking about here? That's the reality. And quarreling and fighting and, and our double-mindedness and our struggle with our, the war within us, the natures that are within us, that envious, desirous nature within us, all of that emanates from that I want my own way. So at the outset, you and I have to be honest tonight. And we have to admit to ourselves, you don't have to, but if you want to get anywhere and not be totally bored for the next 35 minutes, you need to start with that premise. I do battle with, I want my own way. I want things to go my way. And sometimes what I want is not necessarily bad, but it's still mine. And other times, it's really bad. But I still want what is mine. I want my own way. In the midst of that is a perfect recipe. Now, I don't want to freak any of you out, and I certainly don't want to freak Susie out. I had to do that so I could remember your name, because I was starting to lose it. So forgive me, Susie, but I, I sensed it slipping away, and so I had to embarrass myself. But of course, then I had to embarrass you in the process as well, so you see. All right, so I don't want to freak Susie out here, but we do believe in the devil around here. We believe he's an accuser of the brethren. We believe he's a deceiver. We believe he's a fallen angel. Well, uh, actually, he's not really fallen. He's like drop-kicked. I don't get the sense that, oops, I tipped over out of heaven. No, no, no. I kind of think God kind of gave him an extra good shove. 
okay? And so, so we do believe in him, and, and, and the devil takes advantage of, I want my own way. He takes advantage of that, doesn't he? I know in my life he does. He plays that. He, he, he. And, and a lot of times, as I've been teaching the, the growing life classes, it, he hides behind things like the world. He doesn't just do it himself, but he hides behind things that look perfectly human, that look perfectly explainable, but it's actually him. And he's instigating. He's, he's poking at those things. And our quarreling, our fighting, our conflict, all of these things are emanating out of that. So he's playing with that. And in the midst of that, James says, the answer is more grace. The answer is more grace. In other words, we're going to need more of God's involvement. We're not going to overcome this. That's why I jokingly say to you, pastor in this congregation is like riding a tiger. We really don't have it under control. If it's not for the grace of God, my goodness, this place will be, it'll be a bloodbath. And I'm not being disrespectful to anybody here, but it will. You, you, maybe you don't have the perspective to understand how absolutely all over the map we all are. And, I, and I, every time I walk in and I see you enjoying one another's presence, I don't assume that that's because you all are good people. I'm not trying to be disrespectful to you, but I don't assume that. Now, I, I, I believe everybody here wants to be a good person, but I also have a very stark reality that you all are like me. I want my way. And as soon as we don't get our way, can, have, you all, have you all been honest enough to look at yourself at one time or another when you didn't get your way? Boy, am I nasty when I don't get my way. I say things that aren't very nice. I do things that aren't very nice. I have attitudes that are just downright stinky. The grace of God is what's holding that at bay. The grace of God, and we need to remember that. That's why we need to be thankful to the Lord. Because the grace of God is what's holding our bad attitudes and our bad desires and, and, and all that is wrong with us is what's holding us at bay. So James says, there's a mess here. Y'all are being adulterers. You're not, you're not loving God the way you should. You're loving the world. There's fighting. There's, there's quarreling among you. But He gives more grace. But then James says, but there's a catch. If you're proud, you don't get grace. You get resistance. God opposes you. But if you humble yourself, He gives you grace. And then He flips it and says, Now, if you'll humble yourself and draw near to God, and at the same time resist the devil. So the choice we have is get resisted by God or we resist the devil. I don't know if you've ever noticed that before, but there's a, there's a, there's a what's that big 10 cent word we always teach you? Is it a chiasm? Is that the word? Come on, Arash, I taught you something, didn't I? <laughs> if I can't remember, now see, you should come back and say, well, if you're not remembering it, why should I? But there's this, there's this X pattern where, where if you're proud, God's going to resist you. Devil's not going to resist you. Devil likes proud people. Devil fan that. Who's that preacher think he is talking about you that way? Oh, my. He'll just fan that. He'll just... Whoosh, whoosh, whoosh. He'll blow on that. Get that flame going. Get you all upset. Devil, devil loves proud people. He likes it when I get all up my arms and all upset and all puffed up and all... Rrr. You know what I'm talking about. Don't look at me like I'm just some crazy man. You know what I'm talking about. Get, our, get ourselves all upset about it. God, on the other hand, doesn't like pride. Devil likes pride, so he ain't going to resist your pride. You have pride, God's going to resist it. The flip side, devil don't like humility. 
Because with humility comes vulnerability. With vulnerability comes trust. When we are humble before God, we're also saying to Him, even though you know what I want, I understand I may be wrong. You know what I want. Because you know the desires of my heart. You know, you know my thoughts before I even express them. And yet, I might be wrong. I humble myself before you. I draw close to you. I jump ahead a little bit here. but I draw close to you. I draw nigh to you. And, and in that humility, in that place of humility, the Bible tells us, James tells us, that's where greater grace comes. That's where greater grace comes. And those are the moments, though, where the devil then is going to resist you, and you have to resist him. And by extension, I would like to just make the statement, you also then have to resist the world, and you really have to resist the greatest enemy of your soul, your flesh. So it's all on a continuum of resistance. Now, does anybody know what I'm talking about, about resisting the things that aren't of God. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Now, I want to add to, with everything I've said tonight, I want to add to your understanding of resistance. Because I would submit to you that most of us as Christians view resistance as conquering. So when I resist the devil, or I resist temptation, or I resist my flesh, I win. Now maybe you got a carnal preacher. Maybe you have a carnal pastor. It's possible. In fact, I'll go even so far to say that without the grace of God, it's not only possible... It's probable. And when it comes to me resisting the I want my way, when it comes to resisting my passions, and I'm not just talking about lust, but I'm talking about in the more generic sense of desire, things I want. And by things I don't just mean material things, but my way, what I dream of, all of those kinds of things. When it comes to those things, and I begin to resist that, there are times it feels like I'm pushing on an absolute immovable brick wall. Anybody in here, can you wave a pinky at me if you know what I'm talking about? I mean, and then I get mad about it in the church service. The Lord convicts in that. And so then I take, I step back Anybody know what I'm talking about here? And I take a running start at it. Bam! And I look at that brick wall, and I don't see a crack in the mortar, I don't see a crack in the bricks, and my head hurts. Spiritually speaking, all that's happening is blood trickling down my head, and nothing happened with that brick wall. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? And, and, and at that moment, the accuser of the brethren, the devil, I think he perches up on that wall and he goes, <laughs> see? See? If you was a real Christian, you'd have conquered that wall. If you was a real Christian, you would have handled that. Does anybody else have him talk to you like that? If you really had it together, you would have succeeded. But you don't. That wall didn't move. You're still dealing with that wrong attitude, that wrong spirit, that wrong attitude, that lust, that desire, that whatever it is. Fill it in. You still be dealing with that. Now, those of you that were in my class... Uh, Yesterday, you know where this started coming into my head. Because it was one of our verses. I want to turn your attention over to Ephesians chapter 6. 
Because I want you to get a hold of something that you may not have realized about resisting. Now remember, we have no hope unless God's adding greater grace. So to this whole scenario of brokenness, of sinfulness, of wrong desire that leads to quarreling and fighting and ungodliness and wrong feeling and wrong, all of that kind of stuff. We got, the only hope we have is if we humble ourselves and God then favors us. He gives us greater grace. As it said later in James, as we are in that humbled place, the Lord will lift us up. But for some reason, and I don't know how to explain this, I don't know why God has chosen this, there is an element to resistance that is not equivalent to conquering. And it's very frustrating. It's extremely frustrating, particularly to all of us type A personalities. Now for all of you that are not type A, God bless you, you probably are having less trouble with this than us. Type A are leaders. Type A are people who take charge. Type A are bossy. Got any bossy people in the house? And there's a whole lot of you lying right now because you didn't stick your hand up. <laughs> this church is full of type A people. God love you. It's amusing to go to church with you and come to classes with you and Watch you try to be Christian and still be bossy. And what's even funnier is me try to be the pastor and be Christian and still be bossy. So we bump up against one another. And, and, and type A type personalities and, and, and people that like to succeed, they want to see results. I like to see results. And so when we do something and we don't see results, can I just tell you personally, that is frustrating. That gets under my skin. I'll just speak for me. I get very aggravated and then I get angry and then I get agitated and then I go over and I get depressed and then I get sad and then I get despondent and then I get mad again and it's just, oh my, I'm a lot of fun to live with. And I don't know if you know this, but when you're going through all of those you are not a lot of fun to live with, and you tend to be snappish, foul-mooded, bad-attitudinal. I know that's not a word, but I like using it that way. You get all of this kind of stuff that goes on because it feels like you're not succeeding. It feels like it's not working. We've got to remember that the ultimate success comes from that greater grace. Okay, that's fine, preacher. I got that. Now, what's my role in it? Well, I hope that you can see something here. In Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10, the Apostle Paul makes a final exhortation to the church at Ephesus. And he gives this whole schema of using a, a Roman soldier as kind of a metaphor or a, a picture. He talks about these various things that we call the armor of God, things that we need to put into our life. This is not, you do not go out to a store and buy this uniform, okay? So anybody that's a new Christian, do not try to go to a uniform store and find the armor of God. It's not there. This is an, a, a literal picture of a non-literal spiritual aspects. Things that need to be present in our life. So he says, finally, be strengthened in the Lord and in the strength of His power. Clothe yourselves with the full armor of God so that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world rulers of this darkness. And I would submit to you that you could almost say against the rulers of this darkness, against the powers of this darkness, against the world rulers of this darkness. In other words, all of them are of this darkness. Against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavens. For this reason, take up the full armor of God so that you may be able to stand your ground on the evil day and having done everything to stand. I'm 
not at a loss for words. I'm rarely at a loss for words. I'm letting this sink in. Having done everything. Stand. Not move forward. Not break the wall. Stand. What good is it doing? Well, there's two things. Number one, it's humbling. Because you're just standing. It could almost feel like you're stuck. God don't want me stuck. Nope. But he does want you standing. But I'm not succeeding. Are you doing what he told you to do? Yeah, I'm doing everything I know to do. Then stand. Don't miss the simplicity for ineffectiveness. Don't mistake the simplicity for ineffectiveness. Stand. Having done everything. That means you have nothing left to do. Y'all can follow the logic of that, right? Having done everything means there's nothing left. Having done some, well then there's some more. Having done part, well then there's another part. Having done everything, everything is a total term. It's a complete term. It's, it's everything. There's nothing left. And Paul says, put on the armor of God. And tonight I'm not focusing on the armor of God. You can go and read that. And of course, take any teachings that you've had of that before. But rather, what I want you to understand is that when James says, look, the way we're going to beat this adulterous nature of ours. And we all got it. We love God. Yet we love the world. I don't love the world. Yes, you do. Because every time you insist you want your way, that is the spirit of the world. And we all have it. It's about things that are right. It doesn't matter if it's about things that are right or wrong. When you want your way, it's a pride position. When I want my way, it's a pride position. And God opposes pride. I don't care how you couch it. I don't care how you categorize it. I don't care how you rationalize it. I don't care how you contextualize it. God doesn't like pride. Because in a place of pride, we're unable to receive greater grace. And the only way we're going to beat this sin nature, the reason I have good news for someone who doesn't know about the gospel of Jesus Christ, who doesn't know that God came and died for them, shed his blood for them so that they could be saved, the reason I have good news is because it's the grace of God. It is not what they will do, it is what God will do on their behalf. It is not what they are able to accomplish, it is what God has already accomplished on their behalf. So the question is, is, is that grace that is potential, is it going to become actual? Well, how's that work? Humility. That's why the new birth experience is full of three things that are extremely humbling. First of all, you tell God I'm wrong. That's repentance. And not only do you tell him I'm wrong, you tell him change me from what I've always been. Second, you are to become a dunked rat. You're to go down in the waters of baptism and your nice pretty hairdo and everything that you have painted on your face or not painted on your face and your clothes and everything else is all turned into a sopping wet mess. That's called baptism. 
And then God says, and the result of these two acts of obedience, repentance and baptism in the name of Jesus, will result in me taking over your tongue and lips and having you speak in a language you do not understand. In other words, you're standing there blathering like an idiot because you have no idea what you're saying. I don't know how to describe humility any better than that. That's pretty humbling. That's, that's, that's not my way, that's his way. That's not my thoughts, that's his thoughts. That is totally humbling. Now, for all of you that are Christians and have experienced these things and find them, you, you realize what God has done through them, you attach positives to them. But can some of you remember how freaked out you were by them? Can some of you think back to when you first heard a preacher tell you you're going to need to repent of your sins, the resistance you felt? Can some of you think back to when you heard that you needed to go down in the waters of baptism and you said, me? What do you mean, me? I've already been baptized. Or when you saw somebody, maybe your friend that brought you to church, and they're standing there and they're speaking in tongues and you're looking at them like, my God, where am I and what is going on? You've heard my dad's story before. The first time he went into a Pentecostal church, he prayed to God, the God that he had served as a Lutheran for all those years. He says, God, if you get me out of here, I promise you, promise, 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 I'll never come back again. That didn't work out so well. If you're here tonight and you're promising God that if he gets you out of here, and you'll never come back again, watch out. You might become a Pentecostal preacher. <laughs> Just saying. That's what happened to him. God has a sense of humor. It's a humbling position. But in that place of humility, when we have humbled ourselves, and when that greater grace comes, I don't know why, church, but God does not always take it away. Some things He removes, and then others He says, as He said to the Apostle Paul who prayed for the Lord to take a thorn out of His flesh, my grace is sufficient. Well, God, that's great. I, I love your grace, but I'd rather have your deliverance. Love your grace, Lord. It's an awesome thing, but how about just going ahead and taking care of it? And he says, no, stand. Stand. Now, I, I don't have time tonight you can, you're all smart people, so you can take this forward. Much of life is about doing everything you know to do and then standing. And standing as long as you need to stand until something breaks. But in tonight's application, in looking at it spiritually, we need to understand as Christians that when we've done everything we can, stop taking a running jump at the wall. Stop preaching my sermon. I was getting ready to say exactly that. And blame God for having a headache. God, if you loved me, why is my head hurting? And the Lord in my life says, because you were dumb enough to run at the wall. I told you, stand. But it's not moving. Stand anyway. In other words, resistance is not just when we can see active action. Resistance is the refusal to move. Now, I used this example uh, the other day, and, and I mean this, church. I am on the dead, not that I haven't met everything else I've said, but I, I'm on the dead level with you. There was a period in my life where I was going through some stuff. I wasn't very godly. And you don't know when that period was because I've never quit going to church. Later, my dad talked to me and he said, Son, how did you keep going to church during that period? I told him, I said, it's very simple. If I quit going to church, 
It was over. The only hope I had was that if I kept showing up, somehow, somewhere, greater grace, I wouldn't put it in those terms, but I'm going to put it in terms of this sermon, greater grace was going to finally overcome. I'd done everything. Done everything I knew to do. Stand. Don't let him accuse you. Don't accuse yourself. Stand. Don't become frustrated, aggravated, angry, despondent, despairing, depressed. Stand. You say, well, now what good, in this imagery that I've painted for you, what good is standing in front of a brick wall? What's, what's that going to do? What is, what is me standing here going to do? Nothing. Well, then why do I got to stand? Because God doesn't break down brick walls for nothing. So He's going to break down your need, your problem, your issue. He's going to break it down. He's going to conquer it. His greater grace is going to work on your behalf. It can't work on your behalf if you're not standing there. He works on your behalf. So I'm extending beyond just resisting the devil to understand that in resisting the effects of the devil, the world that he permeates by his spirit and his attitude and his, his ungodliness and our flesh which is so susceptible to that world and so susceptible to his temptations, the fiery darts that later are spoken of here in Ephesians 6. We will not conquer that by our means. We will conquer that by the greater grace of God. But that greater grace is linked to your willingness to resist. To finally look at it and say, I don't have the answer to this, but I'm not turning around. I don't know the answer through this, but I'm not backing up. I don't know how to do this, but I'm not stopping. I've done everything I know to do, and here I stand. Now, I don't know why, but God includes us in the process, and He tests us whether we really want it or not. Now, I could give you a couple theories, one of which being it has to do with our humility, because even when we think we're humble, we're still proud. You can have your nose in the carpet and still be proud. Every little kid that's ever been stuck in the corner knows that. I'm in there. You made me. You're bigger than me. You forced me. My nose is in the corner. But I still think I'm right. So just because your nose is in the carpet, just because you're prostrate before the Lord, because your circumstances have gotten so bad that you're humbled, doesn't mean you're really humble. Doesn't really mean you're drawn nigh to God. You might have been forced next to God. And so what God does is He takes you where you're at, but He begins to work in those circumstances, to bring you to a place where He can unleash His greater grace. Because if He doesn't do it that way, when He would answer the prayer, we would take it unto ourselves. I don't like that. I don't like hearing that. I don't like saying that. There are times that the Father looks at us and says, it's not yet time to relieve you of that. Because if I relieve you of it, the liberty you'll find yourself in, you'll take unto your own self to waste it. So I'm going to leave you burdened. And 
And I don't know how to say this any other way, church. But those moments where we stand in front of that wall and we stand there for one week or we stand there for one month or we stand there for a year or God forbid in some of the tougher cases we stand there for years. Can I tell you in the Spirit even though it looks like nothing's happening something is happening you're dying. And when that death has reached the point that he needs, greater grace will obliterate the brick wall. But that won't happen unless you're willing to resist. And resisting doesn't just mean pushing, doesn't just mean shoving, doesn't just mean conquering. It means when you've done everything, standing and refusing to move. One of the sayings that I've heard my father for years and years and years, as a little kid, I can't tell you the first time I heard it, but he'd meet people at the entrance to that fellowship hall, which was our sanctuary at the time. And uh, as you know over there, it's a very narrow hallway there. So nobody got by dad without getting a handshake and a clap on the shoulder or encouraging word. I mean, there was just, that's why that door that Brother Brian has finally removed is because the kids use it all the time. There was a door right there to the right because he would come shooting down the side aisle and come out that door. And before you could get out the normal way, he was now standing at the entrance way, ready to greet you. He'd have people come, and he would say to them, Don't stop coming. I can't even tell you when I first heard him say that, but I heard him say it hundreds of times to hundreds of people. It wasn't about church attendance. It wasn't about their tithes or their offerings. In fact, most of the people he said it to didn't give tithes or offerings. I don't know if anybody's noticed it. It hit me today. I was, I was chuckling about it to myself. I, I have weird chuckle moments, okay? I think weird things. I was sitting here thinking, I thought, I wonder how many of my colleagues would agree with this. When you come to this church, if you, if the, when you first walk through these doors, you go through a survey Bible study, and then you go through level one, of discipleship and you go through level two of discipleship, do you realize that you go through two full levels of discipleship and you never hear a single word about money? Now you don't all know that because I haven't finished it, but you don't hear a single word about money. I think it's the last lesson where I talk about a spirit of giving. That's it. Just giving. Not giving of money. Giving. It's not about your money. It's not about your money. So when he would say to them, don't stop coming, it wasn't because they were paying for the bills. A lot of the time he was doing it, the church was jam-packed. It would have been easier if some people had stopped coming. We wouldn't have had to build a new building. I got the solution, though. It was actually his. For the foreseeable future, don't plan on us building a new building. We'll just plan a new church. And when we get to the point where we're so jam-packed, some of you will go with that new church. Say, well, I don't want to go with that new church. Tough. <laughs> Hopefully, you'll have matured to that place and it won't be all about you. And so you'll, you know, you'll care about somebody else and you go plant that church. If I work this right, I can get all the way through 20 years of pastoring without building a building. I'm working really hard to work that out right. Hopefully the Lord will help me. So I don't want to build a building. I don't, I don't know what I'm doing building a building. I'll build one if he makes me, but he's going to have to make me, Sister Vicky. I don't want to. Dad did a good job. He built a really weird building, but hey, we'll take it. <laughs> this is a weird building. Come on, let's be honest about it. This is a weird building. 
One preacher showed up to preach here and says, never thought I'd preach in an igloo. <laughs> Don't stop coming. What's he saying? If you will stand long enough, you'll see God move in your life. Because our impulse is, is that when something's going on, when problems are happening, I've tried one thing, okay, I've got to find something else to try. So you run over here. Well, that didn't work, now I'm going to go try this. And then that didn't work. And so you find yourself bouncing all over the place and not getting anywhere. When you've done everything you know to do, stand. And when you stand, you're resisting. Because the devil doesn't want you to stand in the Word of God. The devil doesn't want you to stand in the Spirit. The devil doesn't want you to stand in church attendance. He doesn't want you to stand in all of the things you will come to know to do. He doesn't want you to stand in those things. I don't care if you're a pothead. I don't care if you're a crackhead. I don't care if you're an alcoholic. I don't care if you are a liar or a cheat. I don't care if you're immoral. Stand! Say, well, I feel horrible. Yeah, and I know exactly what that feels like. But your only hope is to stand. To allow your flesh to be broken down to the place that then the greater grace of God is unleashed. And what is insurmountable by you is conquered by Him. So tonight, church, I challenge you that in your Christian walk, as opposed to becoming frustrated when you don't know what to do, can I call you to resist by means of standing? Resist by means of standing. There's your title, Jose. You got it? Resist by means of standing. It's not the most exhilarating way to resist. But it works. Because if you stand dependent upon Him long enough, in His timing, with His wisdom, He will move. And with God, there's nothing impossible. I don't care what you're facing. I don't care what problem you're dealing with. And in the meantime, you know, and I know I'm running over, my boss is going to yell at me. Um, what are you all snickering about? She's the boss. You know she's the boss. When I let her be the boss, no, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Now all the women are going to give me a nasty look. See, the reason that a lot of preachers don't preach this to you is because while you're standing there, we got to put up with all the mess that's with you. I'm not being disrespectful to you when I say that. But we got to put up with all the mess that's with you. And a lot of preachers want you cleaned up quick. Well, bless God, I don't know what I'd have done if I wasn't my father and mother's child. But I am my father and mother's child. And they prayed that God would send everybody here that nobody else wanted. No, I'm not going to qualify it because that's exactly what they, you said. Send people here that nobody else wants. This is a place where anybody can come. And with that comes a patience that however long it takes for you to stand there and die out to I want my way so that then God through His greater grace can move will stand with you. As long as it takes. And it means the church will be quite a mess. Everybody look around and smile at one another and say, we're going to be a mess together. But at the end of the day, we're going to go to heaven together. Because if you stand, if you stand, greater grace will overcome and we'll make it there. Can you stand to your feet and thank the Lord for His Word? Jesus, I love You tonight. God, I praise Your name. I worship You. I magnify You, Lord. Thank You for the hope of greater grace. 
Oh yes, Jesus. Thank You, Lord, for the hope of greater grace. I magnify Your name. I worship You and I glorify You. Thank You for Your love for us, Jesus. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen, amen, amen. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. All right, everybody's got to go get your kids. Go get them quickly and make up some story. No, I'm kidding. Don't make up some story.